This video is brought to you by MUBI, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Get a whole month free at MUBI.com slash Karsten. Hey fellas, welcome back to What I Watched This Month, November edition. I started this month with the mockumentary The Ruddles, All You Need Is Cash. As a fan of music mockumentaries, this is a pretty great one. I love seeing one that plays it this straight and consists of strictly jokes and doesn't for a second try to be anything more than that. But with that said, because of just how simple and silly this is, there isn't a whole much uh, to say about it, so let's just move on. And I watched Halloween on Halloween. This is one of those many movies I watched in 2018 where I'm like, anything I said that year is invalid because what the hell was I thinking? This movie rules. In my opinion, this is one of Carpenter's tightest from a story perspective. It's one of those movies that works magic by looking so simple and being incredibly easy to follow while also being very dense and layered with its themes. That's the ideal kind of horror movie, and when it's pretty goddamn scary in the process, I think it's fair to say this deserves to be called one of the greatest of all time. Then I watched The Banshees of Inisherin. Banshees hit pretty close to home on a first watch as far as how it tackled loneliness, and on a rewatch, I found it hit even closer to home. This is such a devastating yet honest movie about relationships and the way it bleeds into the lives of those around you. Everyone in the cast is doing their absolute best. They all fit perfectly in this small world. It definitely is the best Mark McDonough movie I've seen. The last thing I'll say for now is that I am leaning towards predicting that this is the best picture winner just because I have not met a single person that does not like it and I can see a path for it. J just believe me. Then I rewatched Down by Law. Earlier that day, I went to a Jim Jarmusch talk, which was one of the best things I've ever been to, and it left me craving to watch one of his movies, so I picked what is, in my opinion, the most Jim Jarmusch movie. The thing about him is that his style is so strong that I can say the same thing about all of his movies, that I want to live in them forever. I love his slow approach, the Robbie Mueller cinematography, the strange face John Lurie has, and the hilariously dry humor. Down by Law seems to check off all the boxes and uh, is an essential watch, in my opinion. Then I watched Enola Holmes 2. I was wasn't even crazy about the first Enola Holmes, so I don't know why I watched this. I mean, good for Millie Bobby Brown, I, I guess. Good to see her continue to prove her range as an actor, and I think she has the charm to carry this kind of character. This movie isn't bad by any means, maybe I wish it was a bit shorter, but honestly, this is mostly inoffensive, and that it's just not my thing, that's all it is. If you were excited to check it out, definitely check it out. If you weren't, uh, you probably already forgot it happened. Then I rewatched Decision to Leave. Later this week, I have a video dropping where I analyze this one pretty closely, and I will save many of my uh, in-depth thoughts for that. But for now, I'll say this is one of the best directed movies I've ever seen. Like, it's been since before the pandemic that I've seen something this full of personality and emotion. Park Chan-wook really is one of the best working today. And because of that, it may come out a little messy to some people, but to me, I'm just glad to have a movie that gets me excited about cinema like this again. Then I watched Empire Strikes Back. It's a good movie, okay? I mean, it's a good movie. I'm not the biggest Star Wars fan in the world, clearly, but I can still recognize that if we're looking at all the Star Wars movies, this is probably the best one. Maybe because it's the only one that doesn't have any stupid decisions in it. It's entertaining, and yeah, Star Wars, I don't know, that's all I got. Then I rewatched Black Panther. Listen, man, it's easy to look back and call this overhyped, but was it? Because in my opinion, this is a pretty damn good movie with good action, a great score, and themes you never see being handled this densely on this scale. For that reason alone, you got to appreciate it for what it is and for being one of the only superhero movies of the last few years to use its genre to talk about something significant while also being a pretty good time in the process. Ryan Coogler really is such a great director, and on a rewatch, you do pick up on just how amazing Chadwick Boseman was. I'm really glad this holds up, and I will probably be watching it a few more times in my life. And I watched Happy Feet. I'm sick and tired of this being talked down on like it isn't a great movie. No, I'm not saying that ironically. I genuinely think this is a very well-made animated film. The absurdity of the premise, dancing penguins, the religious undertones, the sexual undertones, the fact that it is very much a George Miller film. How are we not always talking about how lucky you are to have something like this? There are some striking images in here that have stuck with me since childhood and I think we should just give the movie credit for that. Some of it hasn't aged well, I'll recognize that, but god damn it, can we stop being so mean to Happy Feet. Then I watched Black Panther Wakanda Forever. I already did a whole video about this one. I thought it was pretty good. A little too long and has its Marvel moments, but ultimately a pretty touching tribute to Bozeman and about as good as it could have been. Then I watched Armageddon Time. Man, do I have mixed feelings on this thing. On one hand, I don't think I've ever seen a film about being a boy in middle school tackled this accurately and with such honesty. In a lot of ways, this felt almost a little too close to home for me without getting too personal. And for that, I really appreciate it because like any great movie, it made me feel seen while simultaneously allowing me to look back at horrible and confusing times of my life through a different lens. On the other hand, I think some of the ways the film chooses to tackle racism feel a bit sloppy and shoehorned in. It kind of oozes white guilt. And the film is very honest in how it tells that theme. It is definitely not the crowd pleasy race approach that Green Book was or something like that. But I guess it just didn't feel like it packed the same emotional punch as some of the father stuff did and, and didn't feel entirely 
necessary by the end of it, in my opinion. Jeremy Strong does a fun voice. I loved him in this. Anthony Hopkins destroyed me emotionally, and Anne Hathaway, I wish she was in more movies. Then I watched 10 Things I Hate About You. This has been a big blind spot of mine for a while, and I'm pleased to say that I really enjoyed it. I was sold on the cast of characters almost immediately. Everyone in this movie is having so much fun. Alice and Janie specifically is so great. It's no Mean Girls, but it's a great comfort watch, and I'll probably be revisiting it a few more times. Then I watched Bones and All. The more I've sat with this one, the more I love it. I think I've decided this is absolutely my favorite Guadagnino movie, and you should really go see it. It's very original and good. Yeah, take the whole family. Then I rewatched 9 to 5. On a rewatch, I can confirm this is one of the greatest movies ever made. The screenplay specifically is incredibly fun yet sharp with its social commentary. The high sequence is an all-timer, and Dolly Parton is giving a better performance than she really needed to give. I mean, we don't deserve whatever she's doing here. It's incredible, and if you haven't seen it yet, you are missing out. Then I watched The Wonder. I thought this was alright. I still have yet to be completely blown away by the work of Sebastian Lelio. I thought the closest he came to rocking my socks off was with a fantastic woman, but I definitely felt the most lukewarm about this one. I appreciated its slow burn mysterious qualities, the cinematography done by Ari Wagner gave me the same unsettling yet beautiful feeling that her work on Power of the Dog gave me, Florence Pugh is obviously great, but you know, I just wish I walked away from this with a bit more in my stomach. Uh, oh, I didn't, didn't mean to make a pun. Then I watched Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Hey, this is really great. It makes me wish Guillermo del Toro was always working in stop motion, because you really get to see his ridiculous ideas come to life in a way they haven't been able to before. I loved the way this looked and sounded. The way this reinvents such an iconic and overdone story is so exciting. It's funny, it's creepy, it's insanely whimsical. I will say the musical numbers are completely unnecessary and should have just been cut. It would have made this a lot shorter, but this is easily the best animated film of this year, and I'm very glad a new generation of younger moviegoers are gonna get to experience something like this. Then I watched The Menu. This was good, fine, fun. When it comes to movies about rich people being idiots, this is definitely the weakest one that came out this year just because it felt like the most watered down. But Mark Mila brings the same sense of humor he brought to Succession in making this so subtly hilarious in a cringeworthy way. Like, Nicholas Holt's character deserves a better movie because he is hilarious in this. I think it does make you look at food and art in a unique way that both gets you to appreciate the value of it in an unpretentious way, even though sometimes I I can't tell if the movie is making fun of pretentious people or being pretentious itself. I don't know. It's definitely not a movie that's meant to be looked at that deeply. You're really just supposed to have fun with how ridiculous this whole premise is. And I had fun, so really I can't complain too hard. And I watched Barbarian. This has been hyped up to me for weeks, which made me feel like I was going to inevitably get let down by it. But no, I had a total freaking blast with this thing. I mean, talk about a gnarly movie. I love a movie where something strange is going on in the basement. Just keep, keep those coming. I mean, probably one of the most engaging movies of the year. It flew by and always found a way to keep me on edge. All while being definitely the scariest movie of the year too. I was shaking multiple times. Amazing direction, amazing performances, a great droney score that stands apart from other contemporary horror film scores. My only complaint is I don't think it stuck the landing as well as it could have. Uh, definitely started to feel less unsettling and a lot sillier near the end, but I don't know. I kind of loved this thing and I can safely say it lived up to the hype. If you haven't seen it yet, please give it a chance. Then I watched The Hunger Games. I always wanted to watch this as a teenager and never did, and I'm just now experiencing it for the first time, and I gotta say, it's good. I kind of felt like I saw everything coming from a mile away. It is most certainly a young adult movie. I mean, I'd say it's more than that. It literally paved the way for most of these young adult movies, but it was a really good time. It is definitely crazy to watch a mainstream Hollywood blockbuster that took itself seriously. I feel like if this were made today, there'd be like a comic relief line every 15 minutes to remind you how self-aware it is. But I miss stuff that had silly looking characters, but took the material seriously. It makes for a much better movie. And I rewatched Bones and All, still good. Then I finished the month with Glass Onion, A Knives Out Mystery. Even though more of you have been able to see it by this point, I still don't really want to spoil this because it ruins the, the point of what makes this so fun. On a rewatch, I will say it's really fun to see how obvious some of this seems. Part of me was like, wow, I, I would have solved this immediately, but then I think about the first time I watched it and I, I didn't see any of it coming. I still think the first Knives Out is a bit better just because of how much more contained it is. It feels like it does a lot more with a lot less. But at the end of the day, I think the mystery of this 
this one is way more entertaining and, and keeps you on edge in a way the first one did not. They kind of balance each other out, but this is still a really fun time and you should see it while you still can. I've also been watching the World Cup, which has had some of the best cinematography of the year. And hey, that's what I watched this month. Thanks for watching. Go watch these films and form your own opinion. And if you're looking for something to watch next month, you should check out this week's sponsor, Mubi. Mubi is a curated streaming service, a place to watch beautiful, interesting, and incredible cinema. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, there's always something new to discover. With Mubi, each and every film is hand-selected. It's like your own personal film festival, streaming anytime, anywhere. It is overwhelming how many movies there are to pick from every night, and it makes, you know, choosing a movie to watch pretty difficult. And what I like about Mubi is that rather than putting that trust into some algorithm or a machine, it's an actual person behind each movie that's on their site. Someone thought it was worth watching, and there's a level of trust that goes into it. You can try Mubi free for 30 days at Mubi.com slash Karsten. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash Karsten for a whole month of amazing cinema for free.